Well, originally I was going to take you from Psalm 23 into Psalm 24, and it, I was preparing the study, and I realized that if I, if I ran through Psalm 23, I, I just don't think I'd do service to this. And so we're going to stay in Psalm 23 this week, and then next week we'll pick up at Psalm 24, and I'll take you to Psalm 26. But today we're going to stay in Psalm 23, the most famous psalm in the entire Bible. This is the psalm that, uh, that reveals to us the tender relationship between uh, a sheep and its shepherd. It's Psalm 23, the most famous psalm. It's a psalm of David. Let's begin reading together in Psalm 23, verse 1. We'll read through the psalm. It only contains six verses, and we'll get into our study this evening. Psalm 23, beginning at verse 1. David writes... The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As we begin this psalm, obviously this is the most famous of all the psalms. It's a psalm that David reflects upon as he's considering the many blessings that the Lord has given to him. And as we look at this psalm, this psalm reveals his strong confidence in the goodness of God, not only in the goodness of God as he is experiencing it in his lifetime, but he is rejoicing in the goodness of God because he knows that God is going to bless him not only in this lifetime, but throughout this lifetime into eternity. Now, it's no coincidence that Psalm 23 follows the psalm that we looked at last time, Psalm 22. Remember the Psalm 22. Remember that psalm is a psalm of the cross. And uh, we shared with you a bit about that, how that, that psalm in Psalm 22 really is a prophetic psalm relating to Messiah and what Messiah would go through as, as Jesus died on the cross and all. And, and so Psalm 23 would logically follow Psalm 22 because uh, without the cross, uh, there's not going to be any green pastures in your life. There's not going to be any still waters. There's not going to be a restored soul. All of that takes place because of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. So David's cry is that the Lord is his shepherd, and his cry comes with an understanding of the cost. It comes with an awareness that the shepherd would die in order that his soul might be restored. And so as we begin here, the, uh, the psalmist David begins to speak concerning the Lord. And I want you to notice in verse 1 how he begins. Notice with me that he begins by simply saying, The Lord is my shepherd. This gives to us an insight into the fact that he has a personal knowledge of this shepherd. He's speaking from a personal experience. He's speaking concerning the fact that he has a personal shepherd, and the shepherd that he has is the Lord. Remember with me that during this day, Israel was accustomed to referring to God in a general way. God would be spoken of as uh, in this fashion. They would say, well, the Lord God, He is our God. But David is speaking more personally, and this reflects to us the intimacy that he has experienced with the Lord. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have a relationship with this one, this God of Israel. There's a very famous true story. As a matter of fact, one of the relatives of the individual who's involved in this story actually came to our church and shared with me one time when I used this illustration and shared with me how that, that was actually her relative who did this. But there's a very well-known story concerning two men who were given an opportunity to recite their favorite psalm. One of the men got up and began to share, and he shared in the way that an actor can because he was an actor, a well-known actor. And he read Psalm 23. And as he read Psalm 23, he read it with all the addiction and eloquence that an actor can, can have and all. And he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he went on through that psalm and uh, did a wonderful job of, of uh, presenting that psalm in a poetic fashion and all. And then later on, this older man was given an opportunity to come and recite his favorite psalm. And it just so happens that he had the same psalm. And he went up and he began to recite the, the 23rd Psalm, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
And after he recited that psalm, the actor was overheard to say, I know the psalm, but he knows the shepherd. And that's the truth. You can know the psalm, but what David is speaking about is the personal knowledge of the shepherd. He's not saying that the Lord is a shepherd. He is saying the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord and I have a relationship is what he's speaking about. Now notice with me that he refers to him as his shepherd. God in the Old Testament reveals himself as a shepherd. And in the Old Testament, he reveals himself as one who tenderly cares for his sheep. If you take notes, in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 and 12, Ezekiel says, Thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. In the Old Testament, the Lord is referred to as the shepherd. But notice with me that David says the Lord is my shepherd. Now, when he says that, the Lord is my shepherd, there's something that immediately comes to mind, and it's a very simple thing, but think with me for just a moment about it. Uh, in order for uh, a shepherd uh, to have a real, real, uh, real job, if you will, well, one of the things that is necessary is for us to realize that, that sheep don't take care of themselves. They need to be cared for. So David is basically saying that I am helpless and needy. I need a shepherd to take care of me because I am a sheep. And therefore, I have one who does. I have the Lord who tenderly loves me, and I have the Lord who cares for me. Isaiah 40, verse 11 says it this way, speaking of Messiah, He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm, carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. The Lord has a tender concern for me. The Lord has a personal relationship with me. The Lord is my shepherd. This shepherd of Israel has a personal relationship with me, and I know that he cares for me. As a matter of fact, that is such an important point to make right now. And I think I can use, by way of illustration, this movie that many people are seeing, this movie that is touching many lives called The Passion of the Christ. And once again, let me illustrate by saying that one in every 11 Americans so far has seen that movie. We are seeing a tremendous response as a result of that. But the fact is, as you see that movie, it can portray for us visibly what Jesus Christ went through the cross, went to the cross for, and how he suffered as he did so. But it's one thing for us to see a movie. It's another thing to say that that actor portraying Jesus Christ is doing a job that helps me to remember what Jesus really did. That actor went through a variety of things, but those things were for a movie. Jesus did it in actuality. He really went through that pain. He really went through that suffering, and he did it for me. And I personalize that, you see. See, in a religious belief, and, and all people may not personalize it. They may say, well, the Bible says that he did that. But when you have a relationship with God, it's not that the Bible said that. Of course the Bible says that, and I do believe that. But the Bible says that he did do that, but he did it for me. And so there's a difference between me just being able to acquiesce to certain facts and say, well, yeah, the Bible says that he did this. It's another thing for me to say that shepherd who laid his life down, well, that shepherd laid his life down for me. And that's what David is speaking about here, guys. He's saying the Lord is my shepherd. I have a relationship with him. The Lord loves me. He cares for me. He gently leads me. And because he is my shepherd, notice he says, I shall not want. Because he cares for me, I will be taken care of. That word want speaks about having lack. I will not suffer lack. Now, when he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, there are two basic ways to view this. One, obviously, is the promise that God will provide for our daily material concerns. The Bible makes it very clear that God is concerned with your daily life and your daily affairs. And throughout the Scriptures, you find promises that God will provide for you. In Luke chapter 12, verses 29 through 31, Jesus said, Do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Jesus said, make sure your priorities are correct and your material needs and concerns will be taken care of. 
Paul in Romans 8.32 said, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for all of us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If God loved us so much that he gave his son to die on the cross, will he not supply the needs that we have? Well, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I'm not going to have lack. Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19 said, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now notice with me, Paul said, My God shall supply all your need, not all your greed. There's a difference. Sometimes we want him to give us things that pertain to our greed. He didn't say that. He said, I'll take care of your need, whatever your need may be. So one, we know that the Lord is our shepherd and that we will not lack, and that can speak concerning our daily material concerns. But there's a second aspect that I'd like to point out, and that would be we will not lack because we will be totally content to be in His care. We will not lack because we have fellowship with Him, because being close to Him is all that we will ever really want, and we will be happy just knowing Him. There's a psalm that speaks, and we'll see it eventually, that speaks concerning the fact that the psalmist says, like a weaned child... I'm resting on my mother. And that shows a picture of comfort, a child that doesn't need to be tugging at the mother's breast constantly, but actually can just enjoy fellowship with mama. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I'm content to just be with him. Wherever he is, that's all I want. I want to be there with him. That's the bottom line, isn't it? To have a relationship with the Lord that is so good and so, so, so mature that just, you just enjoy being with Him. Being close to Him is your delight. So my daughter Corinne came over this evening and she brings this little stinker called Josiah, my grandson. I have to tell you, you guys are going to get Josiah illustrations. Sorry, but he joined the family and now here he is. But I'm just enjoying him so much. I have to tell you that is absolutely true. And she came walking in and, and he's gotten to this thing where, where he looks at you. He's eight months old now. And he'll look at you, and, and he, he'll, he thinks he's waving at you, but he's actually waving at himself, that kind of thing. And so he walks in today, and what is so, for me, is so cool, is he'll walk in, he walks in, and, and Corinne's holding him, and he's just looking around, and uh, then Marie says, where's Grandpa? And he begins to look around the room, and man, and he sees me, and, and oh, oh, boy, you know, it's on, you know. And I just, I just go, and I grab him, and I hold him, and I kiss him, and I carry him, and you want to know something? Man, wherever Josiah is, I am happy. And it really doesn't matter. I will carry him and hold him and love him. And just to be with him, man, I have to tell you, it is just such a pleasure. It's such a joy. So when you have a relationship with the Lord, it, it's kind of like that. You know, you, ha you don't have to do something real special. You don't have to. It's just, it's just the Lord and me. And, and, and just as long as he's with me, no matter where it is or what we're doing, that's all I really want. I want fellowship with him. So my material needs, of course, the Lord takes care of, and I am so grateful that he does. But I have a, I have a, a, a spiritual need that only God can fulfill. I, have a, uh, I had before, I had a, a, a God-shaped hole in my heart that only God himself could fulfill. And all the things that I tried to pour into my heart to try and fulfill that need, uh, whatever it may have been, was never sufficient. It just didn't fit. But when the Lord entered into my life, he, he filled that, that hole there, that emptiness, and so he's all that we need. The Bible tells us in Psalm 37, verse 4, Delight yourself also in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. So I'll be content because God is my portion and all I really need is him. That's why Paul could say to the Philippians in Philippian, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content because wherever I am, well, the Lord is there too. And so the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He continues on and says in verse 2, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. So notice he says he makes me to lie down in green pastures. When he speaks of green pastures, green pastures refer to lush, lush places of tender grass. We remember that Israel uh, becomes green during the rainy season. And during the rainy season, even the desert begins to blossom. So when he says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures, the point he's making is God's care for me is not seasonal. We don't have to wander about searching for food because he takes care of me in that way. 
He also, note with me, says, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Now, that's an interesting thing. And as I was preparing this study, I picked up a book called The Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 by Philip Keller. Many of you have read that. And Philip Keller was pointing something out. Philip Keller used to be a sheep herder himself, and he pointed out that the sheep will not lie down. Sheep will not lie down unless four requirements are met. First, they will lie down if they are free of fear. Because sheep are skittish and scare easily, they need to be free of fear. And so in order for us to lie down, as he says here, in the green pastures, one, we have to be free of fear. And so Jesus makes this possible as we learn to believe in Him and to trust His love for us. Isaiah tells us uh, in Isaiah 26, verse 3, You will keep Him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you, for He trusts in you. The Lord ministers to us, makes us to lie down, to lie down in peace, to be free of fear, because you and I have a relationship with Him that causes us to have peace. We trust Him. And a sheep will not lie down if it's afraid. A second thing he says is the sheep must be free of friction with others of their kind. And he was pointing out that sheep have pecking orders, and the weaker sheep are often injured by the stronger. And so a shepherd will actually discipline the aggressive sheep and comfort the weaker ones. And so he will cause there to be a place of peace when the friction is dealt with. God has a way, by the way, of dealing with aggressive sheep. There's an interesting scripture it's found in uh, the book of Philippians, in Philippians chapter 4. And I've shared this with you before. I want you to imagine this for just a moment, though. I want you to remember that when the Apostle Paul would write a letter, I want you to remember that when the letter would arrive at the church via the messenger, that often what would happen is the one who brought the letter would bring it to the elders, and all and the elders would call a church meeting. And so when the church gathered together, they would be all excited because a letter has come from the Apostle Paul, and he's going to be addressing issues, and we need to be there. So the church would show up. Now, as the church would all show up for the reading of the letter, very often they would invite friends to come, and so you'd have a full house. Now, as this letter of the Philippians is being, is being read, and, and the reader of that letter has read from chapter 1 into chapter 2, from chapter 2 into chapter 3, they have now arrived into chapter 4. And as they've been sharing concerning uh, uh, being content in the Lord, and as they've been sharing concerning rejoicing in Jesus, and that was the theme of the book of Philippians, uh, all of a sudden, Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, there's a break in that, and Paul says this. He says, I implore you, Odia, and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, Euodia and Syntyche were warring sisters in the church. And so their names were read in church during the reading of the letter. Now, imagine you are Euodia and the other person is Syntyche. You're angry at her. Maybe you walked into church that night and the letter's being read and you won't even look at her. You're so angry at her. And everybody knows there's a tension. Everybody knows there's a problem. And that tension is causing a disruption of the flow of the Holy Spirit in the church. It can't be ignored. It has to be dealt with. And you would think, well, shouldn't Paul have just, you know, personally written to Euodia and personally written to Syntyche? Well, sometimes things like that, because it's openly known, has to be addressed in an, addressed in an open fashion. And that's what happens. And so he said, I'm begging you, ladies, get along in the Lord. Now, what do you think happened? Do you think that Euodia said, you know what, I'm going to the second church of Philippi. I'm not going to stay here anymore. No, she had to deal with her problem because that's what we're called to do. We aren't called to run from place to place because somebody hurt my feelings in that church. So many people just church hop. I mean, they move from one place to another. We are the church on wheels. They'll stay in one church for a while, and then something is said that hurts their feelings. And instead of dealing with it, they go down the street. And as they go on down the street to another church that welcomes them with open arms, they never heal from the problem. They never even deal with it. They just move from place to place. And as they move from place to place, because they're bitter, they take their bitterness with them and infect people in other places. He says, you're not to do that. Yodia, Syntyche, you've got a problem. You've got friction. As long as friction is there, you will not lie down in the green pastures. Therefore, deal with your problem so you can have peace in the Lord. And that's something that the Apostle Paul pointed out. And that's something that we know just by watching sheep. There's a third thing. 
if they're going to have uh, an ability to, to lie down in green pastures, they need to be free of distractions. They need to be free of parasites. They need to be free of the, the flies that often torment them. The shepherd actually applies repellents. He will even make sure that the sheep receives a dipping and, and will actually provide, tor uh, provide a comfort for them so that they're not tormented. It's interesting, as I was reading this, uh, Keller spoke concerning a fly called the bot fly. I wonder how many of you have ever heard of the bot fly. I'd never heard of it. You've, some of us have. I'd never heard of the bot fly. But it's interesting. I was watching National Geographic yesterday. I think it was National Geographic. Anyway, they talk, he said and something about the bot fly. And I said, oh, wow, I was just reading about that. What is a bot fly? And so I know that you're dying to hear, so I'll tell you. <laughs> this, this scientist has a vial, and in the vial is a very large fly. And he says, this fly lays its eggs under the skin. And he says, now watch. And so he takes this, this vial, and he empties it into a, a container that has an ordinary house fly. The bot fly is like three or four times bigger than an ordinary house fly. Big old fly. You know, you look real close and its arm had dad tattooed right there. Had an anchor right here. He had his last name on his back. I mean, it was a bad bot fly. But anyway, as you're looking at it, it's really something else. Big old biceps. And as you were looking at this bot fly, he says, watch what it does. And these little house flies are just kind of like there. And the bot fly just immediately, because it, 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 it lays its eggs on house flies, it, it jumps on one of the flies. And then that little fly can't move, and it lays its eggs, and it's got a, a sticky substance where it lays the eggs on the uh, fly's stomach. And as it lays the eggs on the fly's stomach, the eggs just stay there. And then the guy says, now, he says, I could take one of these that have been fertilized by the bot fly, he said, and he said, I could put it on my arm. He says, as a matter of fact, I will. He takes one of these house flies and puts it on his arm. And then he has a magnifying glass, and he's showing us through the magnifying glass. He says, now watch what it does. That fly begins, begins to scratch its stomach. As it does so, it's depositing the larvae from the bot fly on the guy's arms. So you see these minuscule, you know, um, maggots, and he says, but I'm not going to allow this to take place. And he goes, ugh, like that. And he gets some alcohol, and he rubs on it. And he says, now, you're probably wondering why I'm not going to allow them under my skin. And then they cut away, and now they're in a dairy. And here are some cows. And here's a cow that has been infected with a maggot from a bot fly. And he shows us it. And he says, do you see these angry red welts on the hide? And then they show us that. And there are these angry, angry red welts. And he says, well, some of you who are squeamish should turn away. But, of course, you're not watching. I'm just describing, and I'll do the best I can to make you sick. But he goes, <laughs> turn away. But anyway, he presses on the side of the, of the uh, cow's hide, and the maggot actually just falls out, hits the ground. And when it hits the ground, they will burrow into the ground, and then the, the, it goes over again. They become flying on and on and on. He says, these bot flies tear up the hides of these cows. He says, if you're raising these cows for, for the leather goods, when they're infected by bot flies, they can't be because there are holes all over their body when they're infected. That's what he's talking about. Isn't that interesting? Now, we are sheep. <laughs> Let's get spiritual here. Somebody says, please do. Um, we are sheep. The shepherd takes care of so that parasites in the world, if you will, do not find a place in our life to torment us. And the way that he keeps those parasites from being able to find a home in us is we are anointed by him. We are anointed by the Spirit of God. And so the oil of the Spirit is used in our life to keep these things from occurring. And by the Holy Spirit, he takes care of the parasites of our life. Interesting. Fourth, they need to be free from hunger. In order to lie down, they need to be free from hunger. And the best conditions provide for the healthiest sheep. And so he's saying God provides lush grazing for those who love him. God will take care of them. Now, all of these conditions are fulfilled by the shepherd. 
He is the one who encourages the conditions that allow for the sheep to be at peace and at rest. So he says in verse 2, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Continuing, He leads me beside the still waters. The shepherds know where the pure wells and the pure springs are. And the point he's making again is only Jesus can give you this kind of water. The still water is a pure well. It's a, it's a beautiful, drinkable wa water. It's not stagnant. It's not trampled. It's not polluted. It is pure. And so when he speaks concerning the shepherd leading us beside the still waters, it's another way of saying he takes us to a place where we can drink and have our spiritual thirst quenched. Now in the Gospel of John, in chapter 4, we have an interesting story there. There's a woman of Samaria who comes to a well at noon. And as she comes to the well at noon, Jesus Christ is there. And as she comes and she sees Jesus, a Jewish man, seated there by the well, Jesus begins to speak to this woman of Samaria. Now John tells us that the Samaritans and the Jews had no dealings. It was something that had been going on for many, many years. The uh, Jews looked at the Samaritans as a hybrid race. They were actually what they would consider to be mongrelized Jews in that the Assyrians in, the, in uh, 722 had brought in several different peoples who had basically uh, lived in the portion of Israel called Samaria, which would be equivalent to central California now. If you were looking at a map, it would be in the center. And the Assyrians had taken the tribes and had and removed them, bringing in some foreigners. Those foreigners had brought in their foreign gods and ultimately had introduced idolatry to the nation of Israel. And Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. They had nothing to do with them whatsoever. So here's a woman of Samaria. It's noon and she comes to the well there. As she comes to the well, she sees a Jewish man there, a Jewish man who actually speaks to her. And as this Jewish man begins to speak to her, he says, give me something to drink. Now, as she looks at him, she says to him, well, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. In other words, as they're having their conversation, how is it that you uh, are even speaking to me, she says, as a woman of Samaria? Why are you even addressing me? Why are we even having a conversation? And Jesus, as he speaks to her, says something that I think is very important. In John 4, verses 13 and 14, Jesus answers and says to this woman, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The shepherd gives you water that satisfies your thirst. Listen, if you are a Christian and you're looking to the world to satisfy your thirst, it will never happen. The world cannot satisfy your thirst. Never will, never did. You know what's interesting to me is there are some people who've come to Christ who once they've come to Christ begin to be tempted to go back to the world and they forget what they were drawn from. They forget why they came to Christ in the first place. The enemy is such a liar. He's such a tempter. He's such a deceiver that he begins to make you think that you made a bad decision when you gave your heart to the Lord. And so he wants to make you think that you actually are living a worse life now than you were before. And he tries to convince you of that. And he does so through friends. He does that through, through advertisements. He does that because it controls the system of the world. The bottom line is, is you came to Jesus because you were miserable and you drank of that water that quenched your thirst. Problem is, is you haven't returned to drink again for a while. Now the Lord wants to give you the water of life that springs up inside of you. And the good shepherd leads you beside that still water. And he'll bring you to a place where it's not polluted, where it's not trampled, but where it's pure and drinkable. And that's what he says this shepherd will do. Now, not only that, notice verse 3. He continues by saying, He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Well, when it says here, He restores my soul, that to me is a really important thing. That word restore means to refresh or to repair. It's a shepherd who repairs us, and it's a shepherd who refreshes us. Psalm 119, 176 says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. He's the one who restores you. He's the one who repairs you. He's the one who refreshes you. Notice he says, He leads me in the path of righteousness for his namesake. 
It's the shepherd who knows the safest path to take the sheep home, and the paths are the ones that bring the sheep to their destination most directly. It's the shepherd who manages their lives and brings them to the place that he knows is best for them. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 42, 16, I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. Notice verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I want you to notice something, and you may not have noticed it up to this point. To be honest with you, as I was studying this, it was brought to my attention, and I thought, boy, that is true. I want you to notice that up to this point, David has been speaking by saying, like, he or my. But now, notice verse 4, it's very personal. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Notice that? I will fear no evil, for you are with me. David is now revealing a deeper intimacy between himself and his shepherd. And this is something that I'm going to take a few minutes and develop with you because this is something that the Lord has taught me and is teaching me in my own life. And these are the kinds of things that I like to share with you because I feel that they can be, they can be valuable if I can communicate them properly. I want you to know that something you already know, but I want to reiterate it. I want to repeat this to you. I want you to hear it again. I want you to remember that valleys are part of every sheep's journey home. Valleys are part of every sheep's journey home. I want you to notice he says, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Every one of us in this room can grow to understand exactly what that means. As I look out and I look at you as I'm speaking, sometimes I will notice that we have uh, age uh, from the young to the not so young anymore and everything in between. We've got young people here who have not gone through very much yet, though you may have gone through quite a bit. And we have others who have been through life and have lived for many years and have experienced great sorrows, great losses, and great joys. And we, I think, will always need to be reminded that part of the journey is the journey through a valley. And one of the things that I've discovered as a Christian is that valley is something that God actually allows us to go through. He's the one who takes us through. You see, in order for us to reach a higher ground, we need to je uh, journey through a valley first. That's the whole point. Because in order for us to be able to be prepared for the heights that God wants to bring us to, well, a journey through a valley is a necessity. In going through that valley, He actually prepares you for the blessings that He has in store for you. In the Old Testament book of Habakkuk, in chapter 3, verse 19, uh, Habakkuk writes, The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and He will make me walk on high hills. In order for us to be able to enter into the heights with the Lord, one of the steps that you have to go to the heights is you go through the valley. You will go through the valley. Your life will be a journey through a valley. There will be disappointments. There will be discouragements. There will be losses. There'll be frustrations. There are going to be things in your life as you grow and you go that, that uh, w without the Lord, you would have never survived. Without the Lord, you would never make it through. I can speak from some growing experience now. The Lord has been very, very kind to me for many, many years, and, and I didn't go through many personal struggles or many personal losses for the large majority of my life. And then in the course of three years, it seemed like so many things began to slam, so many things began to happen that became a valley for us with the loss of my dad, with the loss of my father-in-law, with the announcement of a, of a pregnancy without a marriage. Those were things that were very difficult for us. Some people don't understand that. Some people can. In, one, in the course of, uh, of a little over a year, my daughter Anna, who is 20 years old, got into two serious auto accidents two serious accidents, and by the way, they weren't her fault, but two serious auto accidents where her cars were demolished. On one occasion, she was lodged under, the, uh, under an 18-wheeler semi, and her car was underneath it right next to the rear tires and ruptured the, uh, the fuel tank there. And, and I could have lost my little girl. She was coming home from a Wednesday night Bible study, and I could have lost my little girl. And not that long ago, a few months ago now, 
my, my Anna was, was driving just down the street from here, just, and she intersected with Riverside Drive here on Pipeline, and when she intersected with Riverside Drive, she was stopped at the stop sign there, a stoplight there, and it was a green light. When her light turned green, she stopped for a moment, then proceeded, and as she proceeded through Anna Green, somebody ran a red light and totaled her car out. She could have died twice. And these are things that anybody who loves their kid will know can really tear the heart of a father. There is just something about arriving at a scene where your daughter's car is totaled and she's standing on the side there and it just causes your heart to stop. And this was going on. This has happened in our life and there are many other things, of course, that are on top of that. And I, I remember when my father went home to be with the Lord, I, I remember um, this psalm became very, very, very powerful and very important to me especially the scripture that says, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil for thou art with me. That meant something to me then and it means something to me now because I know that, that, that it's just part of the way we grow. It's just part of the life we live. Nobody is guaranteed a life without any sorrow. Nobody is guaranteed a life without any pain. And I've discovered that going through these things has deepened me as a person. It's deepened me and given me a greater understanding. I can multiply story after story with you about those kinds of things, but I, 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 I needed to suffice, suffice it to say that, that if you're going to grow, if you're going to be used by the Lord, if you're going to have depth, then you are going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You are going to walk, but you will walk through the valley. You don't stay there. You walk through it. It's not the place that you camp out and live. It's God's boot camp. It's God's basic training. It's where God begins to work in you and develop character in you. It's where God begins to develop your strength so that as you go through that valley, you're going to be able to discover the heights in the Lord because to get to the heights, you go through the valley. And not only that, but when the shepherd would take the sheep, especially when it was during the hot summer drought months, when the shepherd would take the sheep to the heights where he was taking them so they could graze, he would take them through the valley. As they took them through the valley, that's where they would also find the cool water. And so in the valley, there's a place of refreshment that you don't even know exists until a shepherd takes you there. And so he will take you as you're going through the valley into a place of refreshment. He will refresh you there, preparing you for what he has for you in the heights when he takes you to graze up there. That's how it works. And I can't, I can't tell you uh, how true that is. Uh, one of the young girls in our church, she's not really a young girl, she's still still young to me, and I've known her since she's a very, very, very little girl. She, she told me something not that long ago. She said, Pastor, she said, I've grown up in the church. She says, and I can tell you that in the last year, she said, since the loss of your father, she said, I, I, have, I, I don't know how to tell you this, she said, but I can tell you something has changed in you. There's something different about you. And what that something is, is going through the valley of the shadow of death. There's just something about going through that valley that causes you to learn to depend on the Lord more, to cry to the Lord more, to hold on to the Lord more, and He strengthens you as you go through it. The Bible tells us in Romans 8, 28, that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. You learn what, what the writer in Hebrews 13, 5 meant when he says, the Lord Himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You learn those things when you go through the valley. And so every one of us has the opportunity to grow. Every one of us has an opportunity to be taught these lessons. And some of you perhaps are going through a valley right now, but that's a place where God is going to comfort you and teach you. Notice what he says in verse 4. He says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I will go through this valley, and sometimes there are predators, sometimes there are, there are rock slides, sometimes there are dangers, sometimes there's poisonous shrubs and all. I'm going to go through this valley, there's no doubt about it, but I have no fear. I have no fear of evil because I'm not alone. You're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When he speaks concerning the rod, the shepherd's rod was really a club, and it was used as a defensive weapon 
the, the shepherd could use that rod to protect the sheep from enemies. He would take that rod and he, he could kill a wolf with it. He could kill a, a lion with it. He would take a predator out with it. And that's the point he's making. He's saying that you are there with me and you are protecting me. That rod is my defense. Not only that, your staff is there to comfort me. The staff is used by the shepherd very often for a variety of reasons. And one of the things the that the staff is used for is when a shepherd is walking with his sheep, he might place the staff on the back of the sheep, and it's almost like he's holding hands with that sheep. Now, that kind of is an odd picture to some of us. But to the sheep, it's comforting because it senses the presence of, of the shepherd. The shepherd is there right next to him, and they can sense that staff on its shoulder. And in doing so, it's a sense that that shepherd is with me as I'm walking. And that's what the Lord does. He's there to defend you, and He's there to give you comfort. He's there to protect you and to give you fellowship. And that's what He's saying. He's saying, I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death because I'm not alone. I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death because I know my shepherd has taken me to a place of refreshment. I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death because he's preparing me for the heights that he has for me, but in order to get to the heights, I go through the depths first. As I go through the depths, then I can experience with humility the things that he wants to reveal to me because in my weakness, then I am made strong. And I can understand these things through the sufferings and the various things that I've gone through because for Christians, what we want is character, and character comes through suffering. Character comes through trial. Character comes through the times when you're disappointed and God has to say, are you wanting to leave me? And you say, where can I go? Are you wanting to walk away too? Where can I go? Are you disappointed with me? Yes, Lord, I am. I, I, I thought you were different than this. And, and my heart, I don't think I can take much more. Anybody here ever say anything like that to the Lord? I don't think I can take much more. And God says, oh, yeah, you can. <laughs> and you're going to. <laughs> Watch. And you want to know something? You can. Because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And if, and if I worship the wounded healer, if my Lord went through the things he went through, what makes me think I'm going to be exempt of pain in my life? And I'm not. Everybody goes through pain. It's how you deal with it that demonstrates whether you're in, in him or not. Those who are in Christ will say, I will fear no evil, for he is with me. His rod, his staff, they do bring me comfort. Those who don't have a relationship with the Lord, they immediately, immediately I am abandoned by God. There isn't really a good God, because if he was good, he wouldn't allow me to go through these things here. But not, not the one who knows the shepherd. Notice verse 5, he says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In spite of any dangers, he's saying, God provides generously for, for him. He prepares a table in the presence of his enemies. Is another way of saying, my God takes care of me lavishly. Notice he says, he anoints my head with oil and my cup runs over. Oil and a run over, running over cup is a picture of the Holy Spirit working in us. His, his treatment of me causes me to forget any troubles that I went through. You know, sometimes when a sheep is out there and it's dry, there are flies, and I'll, I'll be delicate about this, but there are flies that actually will, will, will land on their eyes and some will go into their noses and, and torment the sheep. As a matter of fact, uh, some sheep actually, and they don't intend to do this, but they actually kill themselves because of the parasites. Because the parasites are tormenting them so badly in their head, in their ears, in their eyes, and in their nose and around their mouth. It torments them so bad that some have actually killed themselves trying to relieve themselves of the pain. They smash their heads against trees and rocks trying to kill the bugs, and they actually end up killing themselves. And so one of the ways that the uh, shepherd cares for them is he anoints their head with oil. He'll take the oil and he rubs it. It's a salve, and he rubs around their eyes and their nose and around their mouth, and it keeps the parasites from having entrance, being able to just stay there and even lay their eggs and all. And he's saying that the Lord takes care of me by anointing me. Now, how does he anoint me with oil? The oil of the Holy Spirit, so that the torment flees. God takes care of me. He says, he takes care of me in the presence of mine enemies. Those who would wish me ill, 
God blesses me right in front of them, and they can't even understand why. It's because my God is good. He says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Instead of enemies who are pursuing me at my heels, nipping at my feet like mean dogs, goodness and mercy is following me because the Lord has my back. And he's ministering to me in this fashion. And he says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God will bless me not only now, but for eternity. The psalmist says in Psalm 73, verses 24 through 26, You will guide me with your counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And I was on a plane. It was after my father had gone home, and many of you know that my father and I were extremely close, and that was the deepest blow of my heart I'd ever had. And there's just something about when you have to sell your dad's house, there's just something about that where you have your friends, our church came and my dad's home was sold and my mom was moving to New Mexico. And, uh, and I can still remember some of our, our fellows, we have such, such wonderful guys in our church, our Gideons, and, and one of the brothers gave my mom uh, use of, of, of a, a very large 18-wheeler uh, and, and, and the guys from the church came and, and we loaded the truck up with all of my mom's things and, and uh, I kissed my mom goodbye and prayed for her and, and off my mom went to live in New Mexico with my sister. And, and as she was uh, waiting at a, at a friend's house and all, and I was there by myself, and I was sitting in my dad's den there, and I was just looking at this empty house filled with memories, you know how that is. And as I was doing that, it started to just weigh on me, and, and, and I, I didn't really deal with it. I, I couldn't. There were too many things on my mind. And so I can still remember after all of those things had taken place, and many of you understand what I'm trying to say, I was on a plane, and as I was on this plane flying, I was reading this psalm, and this psalm became very important to me, especially when he says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Because that reminded me that, that where my pop is, where those who love the Lord are, they're with the Lord. They're with Jesus Christ. You know, and that brought me great comfort. It still does. It gives me great comfort to know that, that, that when you lose somebody, and it's a loss in our heart, but in, in reality it's really not a loss, but when somebody leaves us here, they're in the presence of the Lord. And, and, and in the presence of the Lord, there's the fullness of joy. The Bible tells us in Revelation 21, 4, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. There's nothing there but joy. There's nothing there but the presence of God. There's nothing there but the goodness of the Lord, and it's a joyous promise that we have. And so David gives to us a psalm that says to us very simply, the Lord is my shepherd, and I will not want. I lack nothing. He takes care of me in every way because he loves me. Not only does he take care of me now, but he's prepared a place for me in eternity. So he blesses me now and welcomes me in. Now, in between the time that I began fellowshipping with him until I see him face to face, I will walk through a valley of the shadow of death, but I will fear no evil because I have fellowship with God. He's with me. He will take care of me. He will fellowship with me, and he'll bring me home to him. And that's because he's my shepherd, not just a shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want.